maybe I'll start the second case. So I'll be presenting another case, a case of Dr. Chichana, Dr. Loma, and Dr. Sampson with Dr. Barsukova. So in the interest of time, I'll be starting. This is the CME code in case anyone needs, it's M-A-Z-P-O-S. I'll just like to make this plug-in of two courses we have running today, the Roton course and also a spine course. So this is the people involved in the care of this patient, Dr. Chichana, Dr. Sampson, Dr. Gentev, and Dr. Olomo. So uh, for you, it's a 37 year old male. It's quite an interesting story, quite a different take. She, he, he was initially referred to Dr. Chichana because he, they already knew he had a pituitary tumor. He was actually seen initially in house by an endocrinologist for fertility issues. But the interesting thing was that she ha he had headaches for a number of years, some potential visual changes, even though that's something we'll discuss a bit further. And at this point, uh, all we knew, this was the initial labs. I don't know if Dr. Barsukov, you wanna make some initial comments about this first set of labs. Yeah, he has, as we see, uh, significantly elevated prolactin, which is, was mentioned on even in referral, which is, was over 2000. He has a pretty, uh, within normal range, yeah, his TSH and free T4. Uh, and we do see what total testosterone was low. And that's why the patient was started on clomiphene. And I think the MRI on presentation, like you mentioned, he already presented with the MRI and they start him on carbagolin. By the time when Dr. Dr. Sampson saw the patient, he was on carbagolin for about six months. So this is the initial MRI. We're, we're gonna see, I'm gonna go a bit slowly. As you can see, quite a large lesion with cellar and supracellar extension up, all the way to the optic chiasm and apparently complete encasement of the cavernous ICA. So given the fact that this seems to be a patient with a tumor producing prolactin, I'm just gonna stop this one so I can go a bit slower on the T2 and you can appreciate the lesion also. So, I mean, just given the fact that this is a patient that seems to have quite a, a autonomous production of prolactin, complete encasement of the IC, uh, IC, uh, cavernous ICA, Dr. Chana felt that this was not a surgical case to begin with because the likelihood of cure would be low since it's completely encasing the ICA. And it was started on cabergolin and Sagar to Samson. But, uh, when Dr. Sampson also saw the patient, there were some other, other interesting findings. I don't know, about Dr. Barsikov, if you also want to comment on this. Yeah, uh, basically when the doctor, uh, I mean, the Dr. Sampson saw the patient, he already have a features, which is like uh, basically on the physical exam was like a little bit probably per Dr. Sampson was like, tell her what he maybe have. Um, he has a prominent, uh, in regards of physicalism, I would like to mention, he has a pro prominent frontal bossing and a pragmatism. And uh, that was kind of like, I think gonna you guys can even see on the imaging and that. In regards of the symptoms, he basically, no matter, despite his healthy diet and uh, exercise, he couldn't lose any weight. He does has an increased best tissue. She is like, he has a foggy thinking. Um, the other thing I think, uh, even on the, he was complaining of oily skill and acne, he does mention what he has increased ring size and as well as shoe size, like from 10 to 12.5, which is already, and he has a significant like a snoring um, per wife as well. <laughs> and as in, yeah, and go ahead for the next I, slide. Can I make one comment? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I guess you guys are already cottoning on to what I'm thinking, and I, I could be accused of seeing acromegaly everywhere, so I have to be a little careful. Um, now, I do want to make a comment here. So the delay in diagnosis for patients with acro can be eight to 10 years at least, and you'll yeah. see that in this case. More importantly, in the age of COVID, a lot of physicians um, are examining their patients, but never seeing their patient's face. And... You know, I just reviewed an article from another country that is socialized healthcare. So they do have a pituitary center that is the catchment for an entire region of that country. And during COVID, they did not have one new diagnosis of acromegaly, in spite of having consistent numbers from year to year coming into COVID. So that tells us um, how important it is that we really observe our patients' features. And with my patients with COVID, I will stand far back and ask them to just gently remove their mask for a couple of minutes so that I can see their entire face. And I, you know, in, in one sense, we already missed this diagnosis and I think we're doubly missing it uh, with some of the masking protocols that we have. 
And here it's it's interesting that when they first, the patient first came to see you, the IGF one yeah. is not necessarily high enough to point Aha. towards acromegaly. Yeah. But we, I don't know, Barsako, if you want to also comment. Yeah, on that. that's actually, I think this is the point you write, Diego. Basically, this is, uh, you, you, I think the most important thing we're going to talk about since we already mentioned it's IGF. Uh, it's actually on the high level of normal, but patient was starting on carbagalin as well as clomiphene, and he's already, which carbagalin doesn't have inhibit uh, basically production of the in, in, indirectly in insulin growth factor, that's why probably he was already on the, his IGF was with on the high level of normal. And I think what doctor, um, that's why Dr. Samson asked patient to stop uh, actually carbagalin and as well as clomiphene. And as you see pre-op, we already see what his IGF is going on the high level of normal. Just, just to make a comment, um, didn't really stop the cabergoline for that reason. Um, sometimes it stopped preoperatively oh. for surgery. So the tumor is not fibrotic. Um, we had to move forward with a really strong clinical suspicion, but it was gratifying that the pre-op labs did support that this was the correct diagnosis for sure. But Dr. Samson, just a quick question. I think that in a lot of centers, if they had seen just this IGF-1 below the, the limit, they would have just gone ahead considering this is a plectinoma and kept on cabergoline. What do you think about, do you think that would be a reasonable statement or mm -hmm. that people would have caught this? Well, he, he saw several physicians coming here before he got, came here. And I think, um, again, there's the experience of looking for these features and asking specifically about them. Um, and then kind of being able to spot the diagnosis, but he had two very good reasons why his IGF-1 was normalized by medical therapies, so. And if it hadn't gone up to 500, which then becomes clear, would you still have recommended to proceed with surgery due to the high suspicion based on the clinical evidence, not the biochemical, but the clinical evidence? Or would you have recommended, for instance, the suppression test with uh, glucose to see if there's autonomous production of GH? Um, so if you look at his growth hormone, even off of cabergoline and clomiphene, you know, it's, it's not that high, you know, I don't use a lot of glucose tolerance tests. I would have proceeded on clinical basis because cabergoline can stay within the tumor for weeks. And so this was only six weeks after stopping it. I probably still would have thought, I think this is going to be the diagnosis. Um, it just takes time to see that rise. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Samson. So this is, again, the initial imaging. My point is to just contrast with the immediate pre-op, let me just go ahead to the next slide. It seems to have slightly reduced the tumor, putting it on cabergoline. As you can see, it seems to be smaller, particularly you can appreciate that on the relationship on the right cavernous sinus, as I go here, it seems markedly smaller. And this is the seat, I don't know if this is something you were expecting, just placing on cabergoline, given that it's probably a mixed population with lactotrophs and somatotrophs, or is it just something you would see with the natural history of the tumor? No, this is, you're absolutely correct. So they come from the same cell and development and the dopamine receptors are there. And because his is such a high prolactin secretor, I would expect a uh, response to cabergoline. And so you may say, well, why send him to surgery then? So currently he was on 0.5 twice a week of cabergoline. And we couldn't increase that because of intolerance. And he's still at a prolactin of 600. And so I think when Dr. Chaichan and I talked about the case debulking the tumor and then treating him after would be another option to try to control um, the hormonal hypersecretion. And this is the CT scan that was obtained before surgery. I don't know if Dr. Chichon or Dr. Oloma would like to comment. I, I think it's the mostly obtained for self reasons to plan the surgeon. And I don't see any particular features of uh, anomaly, uh, but I don't know if Dr. Oloma or Dr. Chichon would like to comment. So the only comment I'll, uh, the main comment I'll make is you use a CT scan and of course the MRI to plan your approach. Um, looking at the amount of tumor on the left side tells me that I definitely need to have a very wide sphenodotomy on the left side. And um, when I, whenever we have tumors that are larger like this, I will make my posterior septectomy a little bit larger which allows a little more freedom for the instruments to move um, at the skull base.
Thank you, Dr. Lomo. Would you consider to have gone like beyond the carotid just based on what you see on the MRI, on the planning? What do, you, what do you mean? Open the bone past carotid? Yeah, yes, sir. So we, um, you can. I just don't like exposing that, especially in hormonal secreting tumors, just because I worry that if we ever have to come back in, it's not protected. Um, so I want to, and my goal was not to, I mean, I would love to get a gross total reception and cure him, but I didn't think it was possible. So I didn't expose it all the way. <laughs> Thanks, sir. So I'll keep going in the interest of time. So just to make a quick summary, we have a patient with a macro adenoma with invasion of the right cavernous sinus with complete encasement of the ICA. Biochemical evidence of both GH and prolactin production and clinical evidence of GH production longstanding. There is a potential confounding effect initially with cobergolin. And thankfully, you know, the, the fact that it went, not GH, IGF, this is a mistake, IGF-1. The fact that IGF-1 went up seems to be a double confirmation that this seems to be a mixed cell population. So based on this, the plan was to proceed with an endoscopic and nasal approach in combination with ENT. Unfortunately, we don't have the video, so I'll have to just skip to the pathology. I don't know, Dr. Gent, if you'd like to comment. Uh, yes, um, we have... Um... What you can see here is a single population of uh, tumor cells. We don't have that perivascular orientation like we saw in the other case. And um, one thing I failed to mention in that is that's seen more often in gonadotrophs. Um, and um, one thing I do notice in here is there may be some vacuoles um, that you can see within the cells. It, it may be hard to appreciate over the screen, but it, it raises a, a, pot, a potential uh, question of a certain subtype of adenoma. Uh, as we go to the next uh, slide, we can see it's strongly positive uh, for, for prolactin, but we do see scattered positive growth hormone cells. And um, as uh, Dr. Sampson said earlier, um, basically, these um, are both driven by the same transcription uh, factor, and that is PIT1. So um, if we go to the next slide, so this is a pituitary adenoma. It's positive um, for prolactin, mainly with um, occasional positive growth hormone cells. Now, there are several different subtypes of um, uh, pituitary adenomas that can do this, um, and unfortunately, it's very difficult on this to uh, subtype. I do have one stain pending to see if we have any fibrous uh, bodies within it. One thing uh, that it's sort of reminiscent to me of is something called an acidophil stem cell adenoma. But my understanding is the clinical would not fit that as well as typically those don't have as high a prolactin. But I, am, um, I do have one stain pending after reviewing the case for this conference to see if there are any fibrous bodies to possibly suggest that as those can have a, a slightly more aggressive course. But at the end of the day, typically it takes electron microscopy to do that. And it would be difficult to do that off of paraffin embedded tissue at this point. And Dr. Gentle, just a quick question. Would any, just uh, what, what is the threshold for a false positive on the staining for GH, given it is so sparse? Um, would you have considered doing it again or any staining would be it, considered a positive? It's, spar it's sparse, but it's distinctive here and it fits with the clinical uh, scenario. Um, when, when I get staining, sometimes there is over staining with growth hormone, but it's diffuse and nonspecific. Um, sometimes the pituitary hormone stains can be a little finicky, but if you go back to the slide, you can see those are, that's distinctive staining within individual scattered cells. It's not like a diffuse blush staining. So I would consider that as a true positive. Thank you, sir. We, we also don't know the impact of having pretreated the tumor, which often we don't uh, do that. So there could be an impact there. I don't have evidence for that, but. So there can be a tremendous morphologic impact uh, for pretreating tumors. Um, that's well known. And that can also uh, hinder subtyping. Mm -hmm. So the patient did very well after surgery, was discharged on the postoperative number one without any deficits. At this point, it was discussed with the patient follow-up of both neurosurgery with an MRI in six months and endocrinology in regards to potential dopamine agonist therapy. I don't know if Dr. Simpson would like to comment about that. 
Yeah, I actually saw him yesterday. Um, so his, his prolactin is still elevated as I expect, because he has, has some residual, um, that was not part of the very big bulky tumor. Um, and, you know, often in acromegaly, if we think that there was a total resection, we wait up to three months to just watch and see if that very, uh, that IGF one slowly comes down. That's even part of our guidelines. But in his case, we, we know from the prolactin as a marker. And I also know from the IGF one. Um, that I think we need to move forward with treatment. And so he resumed cabergoline as of today, I think. Would you consider also drugs just targeted for the, uh, the acromegaly or would you just do the dopamine agonist? So this is a great question. Uh, we know that his IGF-1 was controlled on cabergoline. So this is a responsive tumor. Cabergoline is $400 a month, even without insurance. Uh, somatostatin receptor ligands are 12 to 14,000 per month. So okay. since we have a good clinical response with an oral medicine rather than an injection um, and one that is cost effective, um, I would stick with that therapy unless we couldn't control his growth hormone and IGF-1. But if it was just growth hormone producing, not uh, prolactin producing, would you still start with cabergoline or would you have started with a somewhat, somewhat of statin or analog? So again, another great question. Um, about 30% uh, of all growth hormone tumors without prolactin staining or secretion will respond to cabergoline again, because they do have some dopamine receptors on the surface from that original origin of the cell. Um, and we know that if the patient has an IGF-1 that is less than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal, they're more likely to respond. So I use that kind of threshold to understand if I could try an oral medication first. Thank you, Dr. Samson. Dr. Samson, is there any role for radiation? So that is um, another great question because we have such great uh, radio surgery here. Um, because of his really good medical response, I didn't move forward with that. You wanna make sure that you have a good target. Certainly cavernous would be a good target far away from the pituitary gland because he still has intact function otherwise. Um, well, some of it. Um, so no, that is absolutely an option in these patients, but it takes up to two years to see the hormonal impact. So we would still have to treat him medically during that, in that interim. So this is the post-operative MRI. As you can see, an almost gross tall resection with some potential residual tumor here below on the right side and here above on the left side. But as mentioned below, uh, before, the goal here was really not gross tall because we knew from the get-go that it would not be possible. It was to bulk as much as possible to improve the efficiency of medical therapy. And I have here the labs that were obtained after surgery. I don't know if Dr. Barsakov would like to comment on that. Yeah. Uh... Past up, uh, he actually uh, didn't really had a good, uh, great response of the cortisol. He didn't respond well to stress, uh, and his cortisol was six point eight. That's why he got uh, the hydro. He was discharged on hydrocortisone. I think we do see significant draw. I mean, not significant, but there is a basically improvement of the prolactin. But as a man, Doctor Simpson mentioned, since he has a residual, that's why he started on carbagolin stop and he does has a with a normal limit of his uh, thyroid function and I think in regards of testosterone it's still low but at this point it's um it's appropriate to control first you know his level of prolactin and I think hopefully with the uh, improvement of the health prolactin it can restore but that's going to be I think in the future on the and the, the GH and, seems to be dropping pretty close. Yes, so and much. that's, yes, 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 as that I was going to say. And we do see where is actually growth hormone itself actually uh, improving and drop after the surgery. It does take some time, a couple months at least to like uh, for uh, IGF one to improve. That's why it's like basically up to three, four months. And, but we do see growth hormone did drop. And how much of a drop, Dr. Simpson, would you expect to be expecting a biochemical cure immediately after surgery, or is it not a good predictor? Um, so growth hormone is a great predictor post-op, so I would like to see it under one. But that being said, I think sometimes when um, there's been a surgery, there could be release of, if it, of some growth hormone from the tumor. I'm not really sure during that time. And so I think you see on post-op day one, that little bit of higher level. Um, 
I'm not sure if that's also a stress response from his own gland, but I would expect it should be suppressed by his high IGF-1. Um, but even yesterday, his, his growth hormone was 0.61. So I guess the rule is to be a little bit patient in looking at that. Yeah, I just want to make one more quick point that we didn't get a chance to discuss. So he was on clomiphene. Uh, to induce uh, gonadal axis activation. And we know that tamoxifen, clomiphene, estrogens inhibit the production of IGF-1 from the liver because they inhibit JAK-STAT signaling. And so he had two reasons why his IGF-1 was controlled. And we also believe this may be the reason why acromegaly is even more um, delayed in diagnosis in premenopausal women because of their estrogen status. So estrogen has a huge role there. And one of my colleagues in Brazil, Dr. Bronstein, actually treats male patients with acromegaly with tamoxifen in some cases and has shown a good response of IGF-1 to the tamoxifen. Thank you, Dr. Sampson. And just a quick question out of curiosity. I seem to get it that you don't use much the, the glucose um, tolerance test. Is it because you don't think it's a very reliable test or would you, you just prefer IGF-1? Or if you, you can comment on that. Yeah, I think the IGF-1 is really the best measure, um, barring any confounding variables like really uncontrolled diabetes or nutritional changes. Uh, I find that when I have seen growth hormone suppression tests used, it seems to lead to inertia in some cases, because I think the older cutoffs for growth hormone were around one, and that's with an insensitive assay. Now with our more sensitive assays, a patient that does not have acromegaly should be suppressing that growth hormone down to 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Um, and, and so I think that we have to align our cutoffs with the assays we're using. But clinically, he had symptoms of acromegaly. And one thing you guys didn't point out on a sagittal of his MRI, you can see his frontal bossing. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you have the other MRI photo I showed you where he had a 2004 MRI for his headaches, which was red as normal. And you can see the nidus of that tumor, which is approximately three to four millimeters. I don't have the image. I could find it and, and show it, but I don't know if you would like. That's um, okay. Yeah. But I will tell you that tumor was tiny and, and there in 2004. Yeah, it's actually interesting, Dr. Samson, make that comment. Uh, with the increasing MR technology, our imaging becomes more and more sophisticated and it gets better and better resolution and is being done at higher and higher magnetic strengths. So uh, a, 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 a reasonable look at the pituitary is mandatory in every head MRI exam. And I still see an umpteen number of pituitary tumors are not paid attention to. So, so uh, I mean, pituitary tumors are not uncommon incidental finding of a pituitary tumor when it is small and uh, and it may still be symptomatic. I mean, it still may be functional, but not entirely symptomatic. So it is every radiologist's burden to pay uh, good attention to pituitary in modern day MRI exam. And this is the last slide from your partner, Dr. Varsakov, you'd like to comment on this, Dr. Samson. No, it was just part of a talk, and I think Dr. Gentoff had addressed um, that this is an interesting tumor. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'd just like to thank everyone for joining, and this is our flyer for next Monday for the grand round. So, as usual, we'll have the ABNS with Dr. Montezer and Dr. Ziu. Then Dr. Q will give the updates, and then we'll have our CNS presentations. I don't know if anyone has any other comments for any of the attendings that were part of the cases. And if not, we'll see you next Monday. Thank you. Thank you all.